Welcome to the Stetzer Church Leaders Podcast, conversations with today's top ministry leaders to help you lead better every day. And now, podcasting from the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center in Chicagoland, here are your hosts, Ed Stetzer and Daniel Yang. Welcome to the Stetzer Church Leaders Podcast, where we're helping Christian leaders navigate and lead through the cultural issues of our day. My name is Daniel Yang, the director of the SEN Institute, and we're excited to have with us today, Philip Yancey. Philip has spent much of his life exploring the most basic questions and deepest mysteries of the Christian faith, taking millions of readers along with him. He started his career working as an editor and publisher for Campus Life magazine, later authoring over 30 books, including The Jesus I Never Knew, What's So Amazing About Grace and Prayer, Does It Make Any Difference? He has currently more than 15 million books in print, published in over 50 languages worldwide. And his latest book is a memoir called Where the Light Fell. But first, let's hear from our host, editor-in-chief of Outreach Magazine and the executive director of the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center at Stetzer. Well, we're excited to have Philip Yancey with us. And Daniel Yang just talked about how many books he has in print. Just, you know, Daniel has a new book coming out that we know will equal that number of 15 million <laughs> books in print. So no pressure to you. But Philip Yancey, we're so thankful to um, have a conversation with you. Your books are uh, on my shelves, on so many of our shelves, the pastors and church leaders who listen, uh, what's so amazing about grace was transformative in a lot of our lives and more. Um, so you've written so many books and we could, and we will probably touch on them as we go throughout the conversation, but why uh, a memoir and what are you hoping that people will take away from it? <laughs> it's definitely different than any book I've written Ed. All my other books are idea-driven. They're exploring questions of faith that, that we all have at some point in our lives. And the memoir is a narrative. It's my story, my personal story. Some of it has leaked out in different books over the years, but not to the degree, certainly, that this book, Where the Light Fell, includes. I'm at the time of life where I decided I need to come clean and integrate my thinking and my story. And that's what a memoir does. Um, we each have a set of circumstances, some of which we have responsibility for, what school we go to, things like that, some of which we don't, what family, what country, what region we're born into. And as I look back, I look at the gifts I was given, and frankly, they're mixed. I've experienced some of the worst that the church has to offer. People who read this memoir, I think, are going to be shocked at the church I grew up in. It was <laughs> when I'm with ex-evangelicals and they start complaining about the church, you know, they know my reputation, so they think I'm going to defend it. Instead, I kind of smile and say, oh, it's a lot worse than that. Let me tell you my story. And then they say, well, wait a minute. How come you're still in it? We all ditched it long ago. And I said, well, I'll tell you that story, too. And this memoir is what puts together those questions, the worst that the church has to offer and the best, because I've been privileged to experience both. I I don't have the anger at the church. I have a lot of respect. The people I've been around, you know, the, the Wheaton, Fuller Seminary, Christianity Today crowd, these are people of integrity, very bright people, sincere, dedicated, caring for justice issues, you know, all the things we're supposed to do. And I went to a great church in downtown Chicago, LaSalle Street Church, that made that a priority. So I don't have that anger about the latter part of my life but I certainly did about the early part of my life. And I wanted to try to put that together for people. I was saying, and Daniel, a fun fact, Rick Richardson, our colleague at the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center, also in the past went to LaSalle Street Church. It was at the time kind of a sister church to uh, Moody Church. Um, so, okay, so this was a journey for you. You talked a lot about that, uh, that early church experience, and I appreciate you actually mentioning ex-evangelicals. We don't talk a lot about ex-evangelicals in this world, but there is a growing number. Um, I think it's growing. I don't know if I have statistical evidence of that, a growing number of people who have moved away from the evangelical movement because of some of the experiences that you talk about in the book related to your childhood and more. Matter of fact, in one part of your memoir, you write, hell, um, I can easily imagine. I live every day in fear that God mm -hmm. will send me there. So tell us some about the view you had of God as a child and as a teenager, and give us more of the background, because not everyone will have read the book yet, though um, it's out now. I encourage people to, uh, to pick it up, but tell us more about your view of God, child and teenager, and what shaped it? How did it come from your upbringing? Sure. Before I do that, the, the best statistic I've heard 
Ed, on the ex-evangelicals. David Gushy, you probably know that name, is a know, historian David. based in Mercer University now, I think. And, and David says, uh, well, your own uh, Wheaton Institute for the Study of Evangelicalism comes up with the number of 90 to 100 million who self-identify as evangelicals. Gushy says best his, the best uh, analysis he can come up with is that 25 to 30 million were, would be considered ex-evangelicals, meaning they were raised in that subculture, but don't self-identify as evangelicals now. So that's a lot of people. A lot of people. But, you know, that's like a, more than a third of America who had this subculture that included things like Youth for Christ or Young Life and summer camps and vacation Bible school and all that. My slice of evangelicalism, it, I, I shouldn't even apply that word to it. It's, it was fundamentalism, pure and simple. We were to the right of Bob Jones University, if you wanted to place us on the map. There's not a lot of room uh, to the right of Bob <laughs> There's Jones not University. a lot. Fall <laughs> off the cliff pretty soon. And um, many of our speakers would come from Bob Jones. And they're pretty entertaining. They're, they're very good speakers. But man, what a narrow message. It was a King James-only church. It was a doctrinarily racist church. So this mm. abominable curse of ham theory about where people of color came from, uh, which has no basis hermeneutically was taught from the pulpit. Martin Luther King was called Martin Lucifer Kuhn by our pastor. Wow. Uh, our, one of my churches, when civil rights workers were trying to go around to integrate churches, they had cards made up saying, we know you're, you're not a sincere seeker, you're a troublemaker, you're not welcome. God, uh, God does not accept you as a child of God. Uh, if you wanna talk further, you can call us separately, but you're not welcome to this service. I've still got one of those cards. And, you know, it had the typical narrow view of uh, there were about 120 people in our church. And we thought there'd be at least that many people in heaven, but probably not too many more. <laughs> you know, we had the truth. Nobody else had it. And then we had the, the also typical list of no no's, you know, no bowling, no dancing, no rock music, uh, no bit mixed swimming, all that kind of stuff. So it was it was on the spectrum. It was almost off the spectrum because it was way to the right and way to the narrow fundamentalist deal. And that sets you up for a sense of betrayal. So when I found out the racial issue was critical, when I found out that the church had lied to me about race, and I tell that story in the book, took quite some time. I was a racist. When you're a kid, you believe everything the adults tell you. And then I found out, no, they lied. They were absolutely wrong. And then you start thinking, hmm, maybe they were wrong about Jesus. Maybe they were wrong about the Bible. And I went through a real crisis of faith. And so I understand these ex-evangelicals. They often have different reasons. George Barna and David Kinnaman, people like that survey them. And sometimes it's because the church is anti-science or anti-gay or uh, you know, a different political persuasion than they feel comfortable with. And for that reason, they go away from that church. Well, I, I understand that. Sometimes we do have to do that. But I, I didn't go away completely from God. I did for a time. But I, I was open enough to allow God to bring me back into the fold and to realize that uh, what a trade that would be if I, if I forfeited a connection with the creator of the universe just because of the way some church people got it wrong. And, and I think a lot of people are facing that choice today. I'd love to dig into that a little bit more because I think a lot of our listeners uh, are pastors and church leaders, and they probably identify with a lot of what you're talking about growing up in fundamentalism. And uh, especially over the past year, there's been a awakening for a lot of them. And many of them are, are disoriented. You know, they realize that in some ways right. uh, they grew up with a very cultural understanding of Christianity and their views on race and immigrants and, and all the other categories, um, yeah, it's disorienting for them, that awakening process. And, and many of them are, are tempted to leave the ministry or leave their churches, leave their beliefs. What, what was it about your experience as you were processing these things that kept you from, you know, essentially becoming an ex-evangelical, from leaving the faith and leaving Christianity? A couple of things, Daniel. Um, I have an older brother. I tell his story in the book as well. He's two years older. And he went, he went the rebellious route. So he went to a Bible college for a couple of years, and he went to Wheaton College, the Conservatory of Music, which was anathema to the group that I grew up with. I mean, they, they, 
they like Billy Graham. He went there and Billy Graham was a liberal. We all know that. And uh, yet he went anyway and then dropped out his last semester and became a hippie, used too many drugs. And instead of becoming a concert pianist, which he was on track to become, he ended up tuning pianos the rest of his life and had struggled with all sorts of addictions that I spell out in the book. And I, I had him as a model of freedom. You know, when you're raised in a narrow, strict environment and, like that, your first response is to kick away, to try to be different from it, to be as free as possible. My brother did that. And I saw that it wasn't a real healthy solution. He made a lot of self-destructive choices. But I would, I would have to say, I don't give myself credit for coming back to God, I, I give God credit for for extending grace to me. That's why I write about grace so much. Because when God met me, it it um, it wasn't of my doing. I, I spell out a dramatic conversion experience that happened to me that changed everything from that moment on. And I've always hesitated to do that in my other books because then people think, well, I don't have one like that. Well, you're right. We all have a different path in coming to God. But clearly, God uh, showed me some grace. I think God understood the environment in which I was raised and wanted to show me a little bit of, a, of the other side. The title of the memoir is Where the Light Fell. And it comes from a quote by St. Augustine, who said, I couldn't look at the sun directly. It was too bright. But I looked on where the light fell. And in my case, that's, that's my story, too. I couldn't look at the sun directly. It had scorched me. And the worst thing that my childhood church did was give me the wrong picture of God. I saw God as this cosmic bully who just loves crushing people and catching them and punishing them, you know, that, and, and they'll burn forever in the lake of fire. You know, we'd hear that every Sunday, even though we had all gone forward several dozen times each, <laughs> you know, gone through that, whatever we needed to do to get into heaven. And at, after a certain period of time, I couldn't tell the fake from the genuine. I, I had, I, I didn't know how to do it. And, and God didn't reach me through, quote, spiritual things, uh, attract the poor spiritual laws. You know, I was fed up to here. I knew the Bible up to here. That really couldn't reach me. What reached me was realizing that God was a lot different than I was taught growing up. And things like nature, beauties of nature, and classical music and romantic love, those are the things that softened me. And, and just a little bell rang internally that, that convinced me, I'd like to know the person responsible for what I see when I'm out chasing butterflies or watching birds. I'd like to know the, where, where could love, the, the love people have for each other, where could that come from if it, not, if it wasn't pre-existing in their creator and their designer? And finally I was softened, so I, I guess I was open. That's all I could do, I was open. But then I was graced with a traumatic conversion experience that surprised me as much as anybody. And I wasn't really actively seeking at the time. Yeah. You know, one of your uh, books that have impacted me the most is Rumors of Another World. And hmm. even some of the things that you said here it harkens me back to, to that work. And I, I want to come back to uh, fundamentalism because I think, I mean, it's a, such a big part of your story. And um, I, it makes me wonder because so many people that grow up in the environment are resistant to scripture being uh, used to help them uh, re-understand their faith, if, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Right. And as, as you go through your story and as you're unpacking it, you mentioned some things, uh, you know, just nature, those kinds of things. What were the external factors outside of scripture that helped? Uh, you know, and, and you had a dramatic conversion experience, it sounds like as well, but what, what was it that really helped you outside of scripture to uh, re-embrace uh, not fundamental Christianity, but, you know, the, the actual God of the universe? Yes, having, having one mentor who really shows what an abundant life with God looks like can make all the difference. I started writing... Uh, with Campus Life magazine in Wheaton, where not far from where you guys are, spend a lot of your time. And early on, the, the pretty much the first book I wrote was a book called Where is God When It Hurts? When I was researching that book, I came across this name, Dr. Paul Brand, brand new to me. And I just called him up out of the blue because he was saying things about pain that I heard nobody else saying. 
And I said, can I come and interview you? And he wasn't sure. He's a busy surgeon. He's down in a leprosy hospital in Louisiana. But I flew down there and we hit it off. We were an odd couple. I was in my 20s with hair way out to here, uh, bushy Afro. He was a man in his 60s with a British accent who had spent most of his life in India with leprosy patients. We couldn't have been more different. But we, we struck it off. And ultimately, I wrote uh, three books with him that took most of 10 years. I would follow him around to various places. And as, as my memoir explains, my father died when I was a year old, so I had no father figure. And he truly became a father figure to me, and I couldn't think of a better one. He was a brilliant scientist. Any question I had, he had already thought about and researched in several different languages and, and could answer them. And, and we had so much time together on airplanes and rocking along in a Jeep on dirt roads in India and in the Royal College of Surgeons in London. And I could, I, I saw by interviewing his scrub room nurses, for example, the operating nurses, I, I saw a person who was, who was gentle, who was fulfilled, who was joyful, who had an abundant life. And uh, I, I knew, you know, the one statement that Jesus made that's repeated more than any other goes like this, and I'm paraphrasing here, but it's, it, he says it in one form or another six different times. He said, you don't find your life by acquiring more and more. You find your life by giving it away. And in the process of giving it away, you actually find it. And the American way is to acquire more and more, more degrees, more money, more stocks, more whatever. But Jesus was right. Here was a man who was as bright as you know, I had ever been around, who was offered the position of head of orthopedics at Stanford Hospital or at Oxford Hospital. And he turned them both down to be among the lowliest people on the planet, people with leprosy in the lowest castes in India. And yet I had never met a man who was more grateful and humble and joyful. And Jesus was right. He, it, it seemed like he was giving away his life. But in that very process, he found it. And some foundational truths uh, about what a human being should be came true for me and in Dr. Brand. And often it only takes one person like that to show you the way. Uh, I was searching for the way and, and God put Dr. Brand in my path. Fascinating. You know, a big part of your journey um, from those of us, you know, have the, from, the, from the memoir, but kind of your books are kind of a series of revelations. And I think it's interesting that um, you know, the biggest ones, you know, I'm guessing the Jesus I never knew, what's so amazing about grace, seemed to me that you were, well, discovering Jesus in a new and fresh way. You were understanding grace in a new and fresh way. And we all got to do that with you. Um, and it challenged us and engaged us. And now, of course, the the memoir kind of, I mean, it almost puts some flesh on some of these bones that were there. Not that, I mean, there's a lot of it's already fleshed out to beat that metaphor to death, but, um, but what was it like for you to first encounter the person of Jesus in Bible college in contrast to the view of the God, view of God, you'd kind of accepted growing up. And, you know, what are these, again, am I, am I overstating say these are almost like revelatory moments that you just got a deeper understanding of grace and Jesus and more. What, what, so I guess to Bible college and then give us, take us, zoom out to that, to the bigger picture of how you have shared these things that have blessed so many of us. Mm -hmm. Well, the Bible college certainly gave me a healthier view of scripture and Jesus than I had growing up. I mean, they would talk about different theories about the second coming, whereas we were taught only one, this is the way it is. Uh, at the same time, they weren't that different in, in attitude and spirit than uh, we, we are the repository of truth and you shouldn't question it. And I was viewed as a renegade there. And frankly, I, I kind of liked that <laughs> and, and played into that. So I would sit out in the patio and read books like uh, Bertrand Russell's Why I'm Not a Christian. And, you know, people would think, oh, the, what a heretic. We should cast demons out of him. And so I, I didn't mind that. I kind of liked it. And uh, then I had this conversion experience where I realized that I was the most arrogant person on campus and I was missing the whole point. I didn't, I didn't get grace. I had never experienced grace before. And if you, if you look back at, my, at the books, when I started at, way out here in the margins, first book, Where Is God When It Hurts? Then Disappointment with God. I mean, that's where I was. And then came this period with Dr. Brand where I was suspending 
what I believed for a period of time because I could write with confidence about what he believed, not about what I believed. Right. And that that was a cocoon period that just gave, gave me chance to take form. And only then was I able to go back and think, okay, so I don't believe Jesus was like I was taught in Sunday school. What was he like? How can I find that for myself? And okay, I never really experienced grace. What would that look like if I did? And I've never been very good at prayer. Uh, does it work? Does it make any difference? And so it's it was kind of a a spiral, an inward spiraling circle where you start out in the margins and gradually working toward the the key issues of faith. But if, if you had asked me, say, 30 years ago, uh, do you think you'd like to write a book on prayer? I would say, are you kidding? I don't know how to pray. I don't know the first thing about it. And along the way, of course, my job was to be a journalist. And, and a journalist isn't an expert. I wasn't a professor. I wasn't a minister. Didn't have a PhD. I was a person in the pew, but facing this big, these big questions. And what journalists do is grab big questions and kind of take them apart piece by piece and try to come to terms with them in, in ways that the ordinary Joe sitting next to him in the pew will understand. And and that, is, I think, is my calling. That's what I've done. I, I'm not an academic writer, although I, you know, I read a lot of books and research, but I'm not writing to academics and I'm not writing for that purpose. I'm trying to wrestle with the issues that were so contorted in my background that I need to pick them up one by one and take them apart and decide what's worth keeping and what I should discard. Hmm. A lot of our listeners are, are church leaders and the church in general, well, well, the marketplace in general, we're seeing boomers begin to retire and uh, change over of leadership. And uh, yeah, I, I believe you would fall in that category of a of, of, of baby boomer. Um, and so obviously you're writing a memoir and there's a lot of reflection on your body of work, mm -hmm. your reflection on life. You're recalling all of these things. Um, help, help our listeners to understand, like, what's the power of reflection like and what's it meant for you, especially as you wrote this memoir what are some of the things that uh, it brought up? What are some of the things that have helped you in terms of perspective on life? And I hope uh, you write more books uh, moving forward. But <laughs> what does this mean in terms of how you understand your, your body of work and your whole entire life uh, in ministry? It was a very healthy exercise for me. Uh, my wife was worried. I, I would go out into the mountains and spend four days and then come back. And she'd know I was writing about a very painful period of my life. And she would wonder, is he going to be a basket pace case when he when he comes back? Do I need to have a psychiatrist ready to put him back together? And actually, no, it, it was the process of stitching together the good, the bad, and the ugly. Some things I needed to address, some things I discovered about myself to realize um, that a lot of my reaction in, in teenage years was, was a survival technique, just to withdraw, to create a shell around myself, to somehow survive, which people who are abused, people who go through wounding church experiences have to do. And you, you keep talking about leadership, and I, I, I think how important, what an important moment we are in now. In my day, Billy Graham and Martin Luther King and some others offered a moral leadership that the rest of us could point to and understand from. A lot of the things that, that are cr huge fissures in evangelicalism and society at large, were there in nascent form, but these giant leaders kind of kept them from becoming the fishers. Billy Graham, uh, he could be criticized by not acting more quickly on race issues, but he did act. And I was in that South, and I know the I know the cost that that exacted on him, because we opposed him and we made fun of him and we didn't take him seriously, but he stood by his principles. And Martin Luther King in, in a very different way from a very different context. And, and that's what we're lacking now. I, the civil rights movement of the 60s was mostly led by ministers, John Lewis and Stokely Carmichael and Andrew Young and Martin Luther King. They're all ministers and they're preaching nonviolence and they're preaching love and they're preaching brotherhood. Man, I don't see that now. We're, we're still dealing with the same issues from the 60s, but with a harsher adversary tone. It's a very different thing, and I don't know where it's going. And I wish, I pray for leaders of the kind of moral character and stature 
of Billy Graham or Solzhenitsyn even or Martin Luther King to arise and and point above the the squabbles that we that are dividing our country. One thing that is different to me today, and I reflected on it a lot when when I was growing up, uh, politics were not really at the top of the agenda for fundamentalist evangelicals. Uh, we would get exercised about, oh, if America elects a Catholic president or something, you know, that was pretty minor. And uh, now the New York Times, Time Magazine, the media, when you say the word evangelical, they think in terms of a political lens. That's how they view us. We're a voting block. Well, we're not. When you go to any solid evangelical church, you'll find people doing all sorts of things like visiting prisoners and helping out with the homeless and pregnancy counseling centers. You know, there's the missions that are being supported. That's all part of our belief, but you don't see that much in the New York Times. You only see who they voted for and uh, we're not cast in a very good light. And, and part of that is because we just, we don't have the kind of leaders that they're there. You know, Brian Stevenson with the Equal Justice Initiative, a Gary Haugen with the International Justice Mission. And I, I wish, somehow that we would be able to shine the spotlight on those people as the kind of people who represent what's left of the evangelical movement. Hard to do that. Of course, you have multiple reasons that doesn't happen. And some of them are internal because those are not the people that uh, so many evangelicals are listening to. And some of that's external, that, that those are not the people that significant places of media influence lift up. So definitely... Mm -hmm. Not without challenge. The, the memoir we're talking about is Where the Light Fell. It's a memoir, Philip Yancey, and it's it's out now. You can avail, available wherever wherever fine books are sold, I guess is what they say uh, um, on, on these conversations. So in, the, in your book, you write, in the end, my resurrection of belief had little to do with logic or effort and everything to do with, and everything to do with the unfathomable mystery of God. Um, he seems like a key sentence in the conversation. So talk to us about why the unfathomable mystery of God is so essential to the, to the re-engagement of your belief. Well, as I mentioned earlier, there, there are two main male characters, my brother and I, in the book, and we took very different paths, remarkably opposite paths, although we've remained friends and close over the years. My brother was the one who was haunted by God and and really wanted to connect with God. He tried desperately. When he went to Wheaton, he was just spinning through a, a almost a manic e episode of uh, at times being liturgical, at times being charismatic, at times being atheist, ex atheistic existentialist, just spinning faster and faster. And eventually he was diagnosed as schizophrenia. And I don't know if that's true, but it may be. He certainly acted in, in a very manic fashion for a period of time. But the point is, he was seeking, he was actively seeking God. And frankly, I was not. I was quite content in my renegade status. I was scornful of the Bible college around me. I had been really burned by my background. I wanted to do nothing to do with those kinds of people. I wanted to get away. And it was at that moment that, that God met me. Paul, before that mystery in Romans 9 to 11, he says, uh, you know, J Jacob, have I loved? Esau, I haven't. Wait a minute. Esau was kind of the good guy. Jacob was a sneak. He was a cheater. And that's the mystery of grace where again and again, you look at the giants that, that God uses, people like Moses, who was a murderer, David, who was an adulterer and murderer. Saul of Tarsus, who was a human rights abuser, <laughs> persecutor of Christians. These are the giants. These are the best. Peter, who was a betrayer, a denier. And it's as if God says, I can deal with anyone so that no one can stand before me and say, you can't fix me. You can't use me. Uh, these are the best examples we have in the Bible. And for whatever reason, um, God did include me. <laughs> in that lavish grace at a time when I wasn't really seeking it. And all I can say is this happened. I can't really explain it. And I certainly couldn't at the time, but it, it happened and it's true. And I've tried to live faithful to that ever since. Uh, we're really honored to have uh, this conversation, uh, not just about your writings and your books, but to, to talk about your life. It's a very sacred story. And, uh, and you write uh, really 
the two great themes of your life are suffering and, and grace. And you mentioned earlier uh, the death of your father, uh, your mother, uh, your, your brother. C- can you close us with helping us understand why? Why were suffering and grace big themes uh, in your life? And why, why should that matter to, to those that are reading your books? I really only could have come up with that looking back, <laughs> reflecting, looking at the whole a shelf full of books that I've written over the years. And it, it's so obvious to me now because I've spent my time putting my story together. Suffering started even before I was conscious. I was 13 months old when my father died. Why did he die? Because people thought they knew God's will. They thought God wanted him healed. And so they removed him from an iron lung that was keeping him alive. And a few days later, he died. And my whole life has been lived out under the shadow of the effect of that on my mother and and how it moves on. So I learned that what we believe matters. If you get something wrong, it could really have fatal consequences. And I, these people loved my father. They wanted the best for him, but they took a prerogative they didn't have, the prerogative of knowing exactly what was God's will and making that decision. And we don't have that right. Some people do get healed, some people don't. But that's not a prerogative that we have to speak for God. And in my whole life, uh, the churches I grew up in, people claimed to speak for God. And later I found out they were speaking lies, like the racist sermons. And so I, I learned to explore that topic of suffering and tr- just try to find out what can I stand on? How does God relate to that? Um, I've been doing that through numerous books and numerous places that have been part of great suffering, like Virginia Tech and Columbine and Japan after the tsunami. Grace, grace is something that we just have to keep rediscovering, don't we? Because the church becomes so easily, it becomes a a moralism place, a place of looking down on other people. I read surveys the other day that 70% of people think that they're better than others. (laughs) 70%. It doesn't add up, it doesn't. But we have this innate human tendency to somehow feel like I, I'm better than those people. It may be at the root of racism itself. And now the church gives us a place to look down on other people, to feel morally better. And when we do that, we set ourselves up for great disappointment. We've seen that in our country in recent years as leader after leader in the Christian world have fallen. But we shouldn't be surprised by that. That's We're, we're human beings. We should be saddened and disappointed. But uh, when we elevate people, when we think, oh, they've got it, they're better than I am, they're, I'll never be like them, we set ourselves up for a crash, for a fall. And I, I, was, I was undeserving, and that's the point of grace. You don't get it by being deserving. You don't get it by being worthy. All of Jesus' stories, all of Jesus' contacts with people, he goes to the, to the needy, to the forgotten, to the outcasts. And the heroes of the parables are are the wrong people. You know, they're not the good rabbi. They're the good Samaritan. They're not the good boy. They're the prodigal son. And and that message is just pounded again and again. And yet it's something we need to keep learning again and again. We, We try to make ourselves into God. We're not God. We're a long way from it. And the church should be reminding us daily, you're not God, but God is worthy of your worship. And you have the opportunity to connect with that God who will forgive you no matter what you've done. Amen. Well, I think I can speak for our listeners when I say uh, God's used both your writings and your life to inspire generations of Christians. So thank you. Uh, You've been listening to Philip Yancey. Be sure to check out his book, Where the Light Fell, a memoir. And you can learn more about Philip Yancey at his website, philipyancey.com. Thanks again for listening to the Stetzer Church Leaders podcast. You can find more interviews like this one, as well as other great content for ministry leaders at churchleaders.com. And we found our conversation helpful today. We'd love for you to take a few moments to leave us a review on iTunes. That'll help other ministry leaders find us and benefit from our content. You can find this podcast as well as other great Christian podcasts on the Faith Play app available for both Apple and Android. Thanks for joining us on this episode. We'll see you in the next one. You've been listening to the Stetzer Church Leaders Podcast. For more great interviews, as well as articles, videos, and free resources, visit our website at churchleaders.com. Thanks for listening.